got to go in there. Let's see. Hmm. I like the titles. Of, I may just give someone else's presentation. All right, here we go. I think that's me. Yep. Well, good morning, everyone. As Mark said, uh, my name is John Pippi. I'm the CEO of the PA Coal Alliance. Uh, you actually <coughs> covered the, my first slide. We're the trade organization that represents the bituminous coal industry in Pennsylvania. Um, many of you may know that Pennsylvania is unique in that we actually have two types of coal. Up in the northeast, we have anthracite, which is our a very hard coal, and we have the bituminous, which 80% uh, of our coal goes to power generation, and then the other 20% roughly goes to metallurg metallurgical coal, steel making. And then as you go west, the coal actually becomes a lot softer and softer, and then less sulfur. So you go you go to some of the places like Wyoming, where there the uh, it's a it's a it's a softer coal. Less BTU, but it's also on the ground. It's, we call it coal farming. They just scoop it up with a truck. So there are some some challenges and some issues. What we do is we lobby on behalf of the association. I have an office in Harrisburg and an office in Pittsburgh. And a lot of people say, well, what's a lobbyist really do? It's it's a little of what you see when you watch television. And there's some person uh, uh, taking someone out to dinner and talking to them about the issues. I, I like to call it educating. Uh, but really, the best way to describe my job is I'm, an I'm not an attorney, thank goodness, I'm an engineer. Uh, do we have any geologists in the room? So you, do you take nice for granted? Okay, so you have no idea what that joke means, but uh, some people shaking their head get it. Nice, uh, metamorphic rock, granted. I'm an environmental engineer. There aren't too many groups I can talk to that would even somewhat laugh at it. And I, if I was talking to the Wastewater Association, I'd tell you all to get the flock out of here. But anyways, um, excuse me? It's not nice. It's not nice, right. Yeah, nice, granted. Um, so we do have some educated and funny people here. Uh, where was I? Uh, oh, I was talking about the association. So what we do, we really do spend a lot of time educating uh, legislators on the issues. And, and today, I was asked to talk about two things. Uh, one was the coal industry itself and, and the challenges we're facing, just just as many of you in the gas industry right now, and, and frankly, a lot of the supported industries because of what's going on with the economy. And then the second, actually, is, I don't know if you'll find this interesting or not, but I, I'm kind of excited, I've never talked about it, is geospatial engineering uh, in the military. I'm actually, it was mentioned, I'm a lieutenant colonel. I, I'm a combat engineer. I'm a battalion commander out in Johnstown where I command the military intelligence. Uh, the uh, military police, uh, chemical, uh, combat engineers, and also our signal capability. Uh, but my last job, or a couple jobs ago, I was a division engineer. So our division has about 12,000 soldiers. And in there, it, as the chief engineer for the division, I have a geospatial team that does a lot of neat stuff. So, yeah, we'll spend a little time talking about that just to try to get the morning started on the right note. Uh, we're, we always like to talk about how the United States in particular is very fortunate. Uh, this is just a, a chart that represents, you know, based on a BTU basis, the amount of coal, natural gas, and oil in our region. And this is coming from the EIA. Most of my numbers come from the government. I like to use their numbers to explain why what they're doing doesn't make sense. It, it, it makes more sense to me that way. Uh, but one of the great things I like to talk about it, here in Pennsylvania, if you take coal, natural gas, and nuclear, you're looking between 85 and 90 percent of all our energy. Even with us passing, and I was a senator at the time, passing a bill pushing renewables, we're still in the single digits. Actually, if you, uh, if you include hydro, which isn't changing because we're not building new dams, but if you include hydro renewables of around 6 percent, if you don't include it, it's less than 2 percent, you know, wind and solar. So when you start hearing people saying we need to get rid of natural gas or coal uh, and replace it with renewable, well, there's a place for it. Um, the numbers don't add up, and that's really what I'd like to share with you today. And we've had some tough times. We used to be over a million, of, oh, excuse me, a billion tons a year. Uh, these are the last couple of years. We went up to 900, and then even less. 2015, I just double-checked the number. We're actually under 900 total in the 800 thermal. So that's a pretty big drop for us. Um, it, and it's a shame because if you look at the states that have a high percentage of coal or fossil fuel. It's, but nat natural gas is actually less expensive than coal right now, which is a problem. I want your guys' price to go up. I want you to make more money. 
so that we can all do well, uh, just a little, so it's still good for the consumer. But uh, if you look at the states that have a significant percentage of coal in their portfolio, their prices are lower for electricity. And, and this chart's a little, couple of years, it's a little dated, but the, the uh, ratio hasn't changed at all. I mean, it's significant. In particular, I'm going to point to the New England, which are the REGI states, uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, where they combined together and decided they wanted to unilaterally raise their electricity prices for their consumers, uh, as well as in a place like California, where it's 30 to 40 percent higher. And that's going to come into play a little later when I, when I talk about what's going on at the Presidential Clean Power Plan and how it's impacting on my industry. Well, one thing that's happened though, because of uh, regulations, and, and really mostly regulations, I think, is pushing the closures, but you also have the low price of natural gas right now, so we've lost a lot of power uh, over, it's actually 5,700, uh, if I updated the slide, total megawatts of power closing. And, and that's a pretty significant number, over 10% of Pennsylvania's total power generation. This slide was made just before we had the polar vortex issue a couple of years ago. We were within 1%. Uh, less than 1% of actually having brownouts in the United States. I, I, I mean, I, it's, it, some people shaking their heads, that, that's, that's crazy. So 1%, we were actually, depending on who you talk to, <coughs> we were down to 300 megawatts or 500 uh, million, uh, 500,000. 5,000, no, 300 and 500, I lose track. Uh, when you start talking billions all the time and millions and terawatts, you lose track. It all adds up. Uh, but it, so we were within 300 megawatts or a small plant of, of running out of power uh, during the peak times in the wintertime. Part of that's because natural gas goes to also home heating and, and the infrastructure is not in place. Now it's gotten a little better, but you can't argue that. Main, one of the main reasons is we lost what was considered our backup base load. Uh, I've kind of talked about a little. We've had unnaturally low natural gas prices, a stagnant economy, and then the regulation part. Why do I keep on coming back to regulations? The, the issue here is, is, is uh, you know, threefold. First, if the, everyone believes the government wants to get rid of you, and they say they do, they want to bankrupt coal, and actually they're pushing on natural gas a lot faster than we thought they would. We thought they'd wait till we were completely uh, gone. They, they think we're done. You know, you know, there's some silver lining for us. But you, you, it's hard to get investment uh, capital. It's, it's hard to get long-term contracts, which is one of the great things about my industry is the ability to capture long-term con contracts. And um, with, the, with the low price of natural gas, you, you're, right now people, they're burning gas instead of uh, burning coal. And, and, and that, that cutoff is usually at about $4 in MCF, roughly. Three and a half to four dollars. So uh, I don't know what my friends from Range will tell you right now, but they're probably, I think they less than two, two and a half right now, or roughly there. Um, so it, it's, it's real challenging. And it, it's frustrating because if you look at this chart, which I must have changed the coloring, um, th this represents global greenhouse gas emissions, U.S., and then actually coal. Um, and we've actually significantly reduced it. Be, uh, become less significant reduction in U.S. coal emissions because of those power plant closures I mentioned. So we're no longer the driving force. Um, you can look at the countries that are growing. And why do I bring this up? Well, when you're making decisions at the national level, even at the state level, you should be looking at cost benefit, just like you do as organizations. And are we really getting our bang for the buck? Because what we do know is that if this uh, clean power plan is put into place, it's right now being at, at the Supreme Court, they stated, it, so it's being going back down to D.C. District Court. But if this goes into place, you're looking at, uh, this is from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce did the analysis, uh, in the tens of billions of dollars a year, up to $42 billion, low of $20 billion, a year extra cost associated with power generation uh, for very little gain. And we have... A lot of people say, wait, well, coal's really dirty. Well, it's kind of like oil. It's the mechanism you use to combust it, the process that, that, that determines the emission level. We've seen, and this is since the 70s, we've seen an increase of over 163% more coal being burned, and we've seen 96% 90, reduction in particulates, a high 80s in socks, uh, and then 80, a little over 80% in NOx. So we've seen, even as we've 
almost doubled uh, our uh, wattage coming out. We've seen significant. So there's an argument to be made that if we do it right, look, there's a plant just south of here, about an hour south, called Longview Power Plant. They, they actually, it's a, it's a great plant because one, they meet every emissions requirement except the CO2 requirement. Um, but they also have their coal coming straight. It's the freshest coal in the world. They, the coal comes straight from the power, from the mine in Pennsylvania. It's one of my companies, Mepco. They use four miles of conveyor belt and actually go straight to the power plant. So it's there in less than four hours. Not that the freshness of coal actually matters, but I just like to talk about it. Um, so this is nationally what's been happening around the world. I'm trying, or excuse me, around around the U.S. So all those areas in red are states that have closed power plants. You can see Appalachia, which is where a lot of our coal goes to, has, has been crushed or have significant challenges. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's very frustrating from our side because of some of the things I've just showed you. With you know, it, it really doesn't make sense when you take a holistic perspective and, and look at it from an engineering perspective as to cost benefit. Here in Pennsylvania, we have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, by over 22 percent since 2005. Um, now that's been on the back of closing a lot of plants, but you've also seen an increase in um, an increase in or uh, correction natural gas utilization. Uh, we've seen more efficiency. What what people forget sometimes is that uh, man-made CO2 emissions are roughly three and a half percent of all CO2. The other 96 is, is natural. Of that three and a half percent. Power generation is less than one percent, or from a U.S. perspective, about thirty-five percent of of, power, of, of uh, CO two comes from power generations. The other sixty something comes from transportation, industrial, and other other applications. So we, we have a bullseye on us, but we're not we're not actually seeing those tremendous uh, savings that some like to talk about in Washington. Uh, but we are feeling the pain, and, and this chart just goes. Just represents what I'm talking about. This is the United States. The red line represents us on the path we're going on. The green line represents us on the $40 billion a year path. Um, here, though, is actually CO2 emissions. And so you're thinking, well, in this, even with Paris and everything else, we're still going to have, it may be a little less, maybe like that, but it's still going to be a significant increase. And here's why. The rest of the world is urbanizing. Uh, developing nations by 20, I think it's 2030, uh, over two and a half billion people will be living in urban areas, uh, the majority of which, over 80 percent, are in developing countries that need electricity. And, they, and actually, coal is going to be the number one source. Natural gas will play a big role, but because of ease of, of shipping and the proximity uh, to the urban areas, coal is going to be that source. So I share all this because I'm trying to make the argument that there's a different path for us to go. Um, for those, I know you guys have some challenges time in your com companies as well right now, but look at this and smile, okay? That's what that means. That's what the urbanization is going to mean for the, not, the need for energy. So when people say this should be coal versus, nat versus natural gas or coal versus nuclear or fossil fuels versus renewables, I, I think they're taking too limited a view of what's going on around the world. There's plenty of room for fossil fuels to provide what their coal's good at base load. Natural gas can do base load and peaking a lot better. Uh, they can do peaking a lot better than we can. Nuclear's good at base load and renewable, while is has its applications and is and is intermittent. So th there's plenty of room. And when people say it has to be either or. Just use their own numbers from the IEA, that's the International Energy Agency, and say, well, well why are we doing this? You know, it's interesting, a couple days ago, the e EIA, no, IEA is the international, EIA is the Energy Information Agency, EIA, here in the United States. They just came out with a report that actually I was shocked they were willing to tell the truth, that said coal's actually going to increase by 2040, about 15%. Now, we're, gonna, we're going through something. And that, the United States may be a little different because of the regulations I, I talked about, but globally, it's going to increase. And then, now, these are all engineers and, and, and data analysts and, and scientists. And what they did was they, they looked at their own numbers and they realized, well, you know, we can say all we want, but there's reality as well. 
And reality trumps political speech most of the time. And the reality is, with all the things going on, with all the promises, we still need to provide power. So, what, so I would argue as an engineer, if we really want to improve, we would focus on, um, on helping uh, developing nations burn coal and, and natural gas and nuclear and renewables cheaper in fact, and, and easier than what the process we had to go through over the last 50 years. That, I mean, that would be actually a couple of grad students at MIT just wrote a paper on that. From, they happened to be from India, and they realized, once again, they weren't political. They said, the only way in my country we can meet any type of emissions reduction goals is that if we have better um, technology burning the fossil fuel that we are going to use, regardless of what everyone says. You know, they'll, you'll still try, even if you increase uh, renewables by a couple percent in India and China, that's a, that's a lot, but you still got to supply the other 90-some percent of your population. So. It's not against anything, it's just looking at different ways. So with everything I said, uh, we have the Clean Power Plan now. The EPA has come back and uh, they made a law that basically made, said that we had to reach a, a CO2 emissions reduction levels that are unachievable uh, with current coal technology. Uh, and it was taken to court and for a whole bunch of reasons the, the, the Supreme Court did something they've never done. They said, stop. They actually gave a stay. We thought we didn't think that there was a chance that would happen. Because you have to show irreparable harm. You have to show a cost and impact to an industry that's so significant that the regulations put on hold until this is decided in the courts. The, this chart shows, or this picture shows, uh, the states who have actually written in opposition or to the Clean Power Plan. There are about 28 of them. The, Blue ones are states that are that have support written in support. If you if I was to superimpose the other chart I showed you with the pricing, about 35 to 40 percent higher, 20 to 30 percent higher than Pennsylvania. So the states who are at, who are supportive are the ones who are already you know, drinking the Kool Aid and spending a lot of money for electricity and losing jobs. Especially they're losing a lot of jobs to there, by the way, uh, for taxes and, and, and energy reasons. Uh, so it, it's just a, it, it's an interesting thing, and that also may look like a political map going down the road in, in November. Not exactly, but it will be pretty close. Yeah. Pennsylvania, we have a Republican legislature, a Democratic governor, a Democratic attorney general. So we are what I call milk toast, straight in the middle. We don't have the guts to say either way. So <laughs> sorry, but that's the reality. Uh, now I wouldn't be a good engineer if I didn't come up with solutions, because that's what we're do, paid to do. Is, and there are a lot of different things we can do that would reduce greenhouse gases, uh, that would that, um, reduce our carbon footprint, but also everything here in the blue represents the type of things that would, uh, re with a cost, um, would, uh, would be less than the, the, uh, the benefit would outweigh the cost <coughs> on the right in yellow. I should have made it in red, but in yellow is the things that would, would be more cost. Uh, the, the, the benefits would be less than the actual cost, so it would be... Uh, uh, a negative result, and then the width of the the height, or is the actual uh, reduction, or the the amount of money saved, and, and the tune of 90 million, and the width is the amount of uh, CO2 emissions reduced. I I share this with you just to show this that there are options out there that are comprehensive that include improve, improvements in power plants. Commercial buildings, light truck fuel, car fuel. By the way, natural gas, if you guys are busy, you know, want something to do, that'd be a nice thing. You guys are doing a lot of good work with our fleets right now. Keep it up, because I think that's, that, that's one way of, of us to improve or, or reduce our emissions. Industrial processes. Uh, here's the interesting thing, and I share with you. Uh, car hybridization has really the least amount, and is one of the most expensive technologies, as is uh, forcing us to go to uh, CCS carbon capture and sequestration. Once we can get that to move a little to the left, then it would make sense. Hybrid cars are great, um, I'm just, but from a governmental mandating perspective, you know, that, that's one of those things where you may, you may want to look at. As a matter of fact, I, I wish I had one, I'd ride 50,000 miles a year talking, giving speeches. Uh, this chart just talks about that there are ways to reduce, significantly reduce CO2, and these are existing types of plants, uh, increasing our efficiencies. You know, we go from our average plant right now is about a little, about 35 percent. Actually, it's a little less. 
most of the plants are in the 30% efficiency uh, with about 2,000 megawatts or 2,000 uh, pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. If we were just to build some of the, the middle road, we would cut our uh, megawatts per hour by about 400 uh, pounds, megawatts per hour, or 20%. We'd increase our efficiency up, up to almost you know, 30 to 39%. And even and if we started to get really aggressive, we could increase our efficiencies up to 42. And, and, and we, you would, you, we start to hit a you know, plateau in there with the CO2 emissions. But the, my, my point is, just by building a new plant, you could reduce your CO2 emissions by 20% for, for our coal industry. And then if you're allowed to, you know, if you combine it with natural gas, you can even get to a 30 percentiles. So there, th that's one way to have us get there. Or the other way is a government approach, which is get rid of coal, and then we'll get to 30 percentile because we'll eliminate 30 uh, percent of our portfolio. The problem is uh, the same people don't want to get rid of coal, don't want to see new natural gas pipelines and new natural gas plants. And, oh, and some of them also don't want to see wind because wind has a tendency to kill those beautiful birds I like. Um, because you know, wind is in windy areas and birds aren't dumb. Well, most of them, and they fly where windy areas are. And you've, pro you've probably seen those articles recently about the fight that's going on right now uh, between the wind people and some of the uh, um, associations that support you know, animals and stuff like that. So this is just a, another way to show it. We have metrics I'm not going to get into too much, but you know, there are plans that would have us be the best we can be now with our existing technology and then have regulations in place. We don't really need uh, money from the government. What we need the government to do is what they did with the auto industry, which is incremental improvement, um, support new technology, and make it easy. If we wanted to replace an existing coal-fired power plant with a new, more efficient one that was 20% more efficient, you would think we could just, since we're going to have less reductions, we could, we could run under the old permit, right? No, it doesn't work that way. We'd have to go through a whole new permitting process and go through all the lawsuits by the environmentalists that don't want us to clean up, they want us to go away. So what's happening is you're not seeing us replace the old plants. And plus, because of regulatory issues right now, it's not economically viable. Uh, you can't get the long-term uh, regulations that, that you know, we can, or you can have some type of consistency in regulations. So it's challenging, but there, there are options there for us. I, I, I like to say that uh, we're a partner. We want to maximize efficiency, increase domestic oil and gas. And actually, I say that in other places too, not just because I'm in range resources building, and I like some of the people, most of the people here, I think, uh, recognize the role for clean coal and then allow investment technology. Uh, I testify a lot, and this, this is recently in Harrisburg, but we have a lot of ex experts that uh, we go to and what they're saying is, you know, we're going through some challenging times, um, but there is a silver lining. A lot of the charts I showed you talked about population growth. A lot of the charts I showed you um, I talked about the technology that's readily available. Natural gas, uh, LNG, um, you know, more pipelines getting that gas to the market, especially in the Northeast. Those are all things that the coal industry supports because, you know, we're partners. We and we want you to get more value for your gas, so your price comes up better. So you you invest in more geo people. Um, here's a I will end on the coal side with with this little chart because I like easy to explain charts. Um, I recently spoke to a log group about what the clean power plan and. For those who are going back and, and do work in the industry, uh, you, you can have a copy of this. I had our attorneys put together. But this basically goes through what's, what occurred. The Supreme Court on February 9th said no to the EPA. They, they sent it back to the D.C. Circuit Court. They're going to start hearing the arguments in June. If the panel upholds the Clean Power Plan, then there's going to go through this petitions. If the D.C. Circuit vacates it, well then the EPA is probably going to have to go back and start over. However, not likely, frankly, because the D.C. Circuit was the one who agreed on it the first time, and also the President Obama's nominee, nominee is one who led that charge. Um, so they'll probably uphold it or, or make some slight adjustments. So they will go through a whole process. The bottom line is that you know, we should, at the earliest this fall, have an answer as to whether the Clean Power Plan is going to come through in the 
current form. If they follow their normal timeline, it will actually be sometime next year. But given the presidential election and the push to try to resolve some of these issues, it actually may be sped up. But that's a very good chart if you have to brief your boss on what's going on in the clean power plant. Uh, now, I was also asked to talk about the geospatial. And I've never done this before, actually, to a group outside the military. So that you're my first if I mess it up. Uh, understand I'm an environmental engineer, not a geospatial guy, but I've commanded geospatial um, elements. And, and I will tell you, it's interesting. Uh, we use everything. And, and instead of giving you about five slides and then coming out and answering questions, uh, as a good officer, I did some research. I said, I wonder if we have any examples of imagery. And when I looked, I found, oh, wait, we have a two-minute video. So if you could watch this video for two minutes, this will tell you what our geospatial people do. I'll, I'll come back and tell you how I use them, and then uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So hopefully this works. My name is Chief Warrant Officer for William Jones. I'm a geospatial engineering technician. And I'm currently assigned to the Army Geospatial Center. We provide geospatial engineering expertise to not only the Corps of Engineers, but uh, subordinate Army units uh, around the globe. One day we could be supporting um, the fight against ISIS or ISIL, and the next day we could be uh, helping out uh, United States Army Africa with the Ebola relief efforts. And there's some science behind it. It's going to be along this route. There's a lot of math behind it, but there's also a lot of art behind uh, making uh, making a map or making a geospatial engineer product in a three-dimensional uh, computer-generated environment. So almost like a almost like a gaming system type of environment. Every week, there's something new. It's color imagery and it's elevation data. Something different. The laser is painting the surface of the Earth, and it's always challenging. most important job is to help the commander visualize the terrain, what we now call the operating environment. So we gather all the data, we're vetting the data, you know, there's a line there, but what does that line mean? It means a road, what kind of road? A uh, hard surface road, a paved road, a dirt road, um, how wide is the road, how many vehicles can travel on it, how can we move troops and equipment uh, around in Liberia and uh, in support of the Ebola relief effort. It almost takes you to places in the world you've never been. I pretty much have uh, supported like the DEA, the Border Patrol, uh, military, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, even some civilians. And everywhere that um, uh, large missions, large operations are planned, um, geospatial engineers are there. The skill set is, is just unbelievably remarkable. It's very valuable to the Army, and it's just as you know, highly sought after in this way. So. I don't know if that was exciting for me uh, for you, but I kind of enjoy that type of stuff. So, geospatial, it's interesting. In the Army, a lot of, I don't know, how many here have been in the military before? Any geo, any 12, any geotechnical people? Okay, good. So then, oh, you, you sir? Good. Were you a geotechnical guy in the Army? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, Air Force uh, geospatial. Oh, oh, well then. They're good too. Um, and, and they actually have, usually they have better uh, living uh, accommodations in the military. I'm not <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my father was here, of course. He, he wondered why I decided to go to West Point. But, so it's interesting, and, and I'll finish on this. I don't know how much, are we doing okay? Um, I met a, 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 a combat engineer, so it, I, I don't know um, how you guys view it. You know, we have all this different technology. Our geo teams, if I was talking to you 10 years ago, I would be talking to you, you know, I would have had 15 years in the military, you know, a, a major a field grade officer, and I would be talking to you about the great maps my, my geotechnical team make. And I would be doing a bad job because I would be only touching on 20% or 30% of their capability. And, and so in the military we've understood, especially with us going all around the world, um, how important imagery is. And as a combat engineer, everything from determining routes, if we need to do resupply, to determining, uh, I was in Iraq in 2003, uh, you know, where can I get gravel based on the terrain analysis? 
Uh, where, where is there likely water places if we have to build a fob and we need to maybe help a local area? In an urban environment, you saw some of the, the mapping in an urban environment. You know, we, uh, we, uh, we use different, um, I don't know if it's, well, we have different technologies that we use, but very similar to what you do, 3D flybys, uh, so we can understand what the terrain is before we go on a mission. Uh, the ability to, uh, from a combat engineer, uh, look at elevation changes and where to put my weapon systems so that we can protect our force to where the enemy would most likely put their weapon systems. I'm going to Qatar. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to the Middle East. Uh, I'll be in a couple different countries in, in, in early this fall uh, for another deployment, so I've been spending a lot of time doing analysis right now in some of the areas I'm going and looking at the critical pipe infrastructure, looking at the elect electrical, electrical, looking at just, it, it, it's interesting the application. So I'm sharing that with you because if any of you are interested, you know, we, we don't have enough qualified people. Uh, you have to be pretty smart to be, to be a geo person. So, you know, if, if, if you're interested, email me. Uh, our unit's up at 40, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's not that far away. Um, but I, I want to tell you that I know there are, with the applications, Corps, U.S. Corps, Army Corps of Engineers, I'm, uh, also obviously a lot of you may work with them, whether it's with the ports or some of the other stuff. But there, it's interesting what we have, we've evolved in the military from just uh, having good and accurate data to our geo teams really becoming those experts that provide the analysis. And that's what I always tell my teams is that, you know, I, I know you can make me a map, um, but uh, what, what really makes it great and what really makes our geo team special is we are bringing them in early on the planning process and they start giving me things I didn't think of asking for. You know, above and beyond the mapping, uh, but, you know, site layouts, you know, we, we, before I even think about where we can put it, because my guys know how I think now. You know, they tell me areas, frankly, where there's flat areas where we can do medevacs, or if we have uh, displaced persons, where we can have a displaced person place. So every time I'm doing a, I'm uh, looking at a regional operational area, I, they they put out every hospital, every power station, every stadium, every large facility. So it's it's just, uh, I'll tell you that our, our geo teams are pretty cool. Uh, we're real proud of them. And that's that's not me, but that's what I look like most of the time when we're at the beginning. We're looking at our computer systems. So it is really impressive. Now there's a flip side is when I don't have a geo team and I ask someone that's not geo trained for uh, so, so giving some train analysis on Cutter, this is what I get. So um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so there, you, uh, to all of you, I want to thank you for letting me speak today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you're interested, the military would love you. Uh, if not, we appreciate the work you're doing, and there is a silver lining. Um, the world needs energy, and they're going to get that from coal, natural gas, nuclear, renewables. So hopefully, you know, we'll all be back here a few years talking about how good it was when it came back. So I'll stop on, uh, on that note, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.